Hello, I am Dr. Peter Johnson. I'll be talking to you a little bit about chest imaging. Here are a few resources which you may find useful. But for today's talk, we're going to be focusing on the following general headlines or topics. We're going to look at the general approach to imaging the chest. We'll spend a bit of time looking at the evaluation of a chest radiograph, and then we'll look at some examples of pathology and we'll talk a little bit about CT and then we'll wrap up. When you're imaging the chest, you have to remember radiology has two parts. There's a diagnostic arm, which majority of radiologists do, and then there's intervention, which has various types of procedures that you can use imaging to guide. To guide. These include biopsies of various types of masses or other processes, uh, endovascular treatment of various vascular abnormalities, as we've mentioned here, and you can drain various things, including abscesses and other collections. There are different types of imaging tests that can be used for diagnostic purposes, and a bunch of them are listed here. Chest radiography is probably the most common type of imaging test done in general, but other tests include CT scans, uh, various types of nuclear medicine, MRI, etc. And they're all listed here. Each have their own pros and cons, but we'll be focusing for the most part on the chest radiograph today. As noted before, it's probably the single most common imaging investigation done. It's a useful screening tool. It's low cost, good diagnostic yield, and Although there is ionizing radiation, the dose is pretty low. So let us look at how we evaluate a chest x-ray. So here is a normal chest radiograph. But before you can get into looking at looking for pathology, etc., you need to do some quality control. You need to determine is this radiograph of diagnostic quality in the patient that you're intending and on the day that you're intending. So there's usually some marker on the film which indicates the patient's name, a bunch of demographic data, including their age, etc. They're not on this film because this is anonymized, but it is usually somewhere on the film. You need to look at that. You need to look for the side marker. The only person who can tell you which side is right or left is the radiographer who, or the technician who did the film. So you need to look for that side marker. After you've satisfied yourself with those things, then you look at the image quality in general. You need to know what sort of film this is. This is a chest radiograph and it is a frontal projection. Now there are two ways to do a frontal projection. So going to this lateral, if you're going to do a frontal projection and the projection refers to the direction that the x-ray beam is going. So Let's use the anterior posterior projection first. In this case, you'll have the x-ray tube facing the patient. The x-ray cassette or detector is behind the patient and the x-ray passes from anterior to posterior. And that is an anterior posterior projection or people will abbreviate that as a AP, an AP projection. The other way around is for a posterior anterior projection or PA projection, the cassette is adjacent to the anterior chest wall, this patient goes right up against it, and then the x-ray tube is behind the patient and the x-ray beam goes from a posterior to anterior projection. A lateral projection like this is from side to side. The tube is on one end, the cassette is on the other end, and the x-ray beam goes from one side to the other. Now why is it that you need to know the projection? Because an AP and a PA projection can look almost the same. Well, the reason for that, one of the reasons for that is that you do a measurement called the cardiothoracic ratio, and that is used to assess the heart size. This is the widest diameter of the heart divided by the widest di diameter of the thoracic cavity, and that is measured from the inner chest wall on one side to the inner chest wall on the other side, so that widest dimension. So it's the widest dimension of the heart over the widest dimension of the thoracic cavity, the cardiothoracic ratio. And if it's over 50%, the heart is enlarged. 
Now, that ratio is a linear equation and it only works, or it's only reliable if the patient, if the magnification of the image is constant. So, let's talk a little bit about magnification. If you remember back in your prep school or maybe high school days, if you were to, if you shine, if you shine a light on your hand, for example, and it casts a shadow on, on, on the wall, if you pull your hand away from the wall, the shadow on the wall will become magnified. Okay, so that's basic optics. But not only does it become magnified, if you look at the image, the more magnified the image is, the more blurry it tends to look or it loses sharpness. So what you want to try to do is minimize your magnification so that you can get the best quality sharpness, but you also want to keep that magnification constant, right? So that your cardiothoracic ratio works. So let's look at a, a PA projection first. And the PA projection is the ideal projection. This is the one you want to do if you can do it, right? And should be done on all patients who can tolerate the positioning for it. So, the cassette is anterior to the patient, right? The patient is right against that cassette. The heart and mediastinum are anterior structures within the thoracic cavity. The, the heart is really stuck right against the anterior chest wall. So, if you can imagine, therefore, it's the closest the heart will ever get to a cassette. So, the heart size is going to be the magnification of the heart and the mediastinum will be minimal in this case, right? And also, because this distance is pretty much fixed, your magnification is going to be constant from film to film. If you flip it around and do an anterior-posterior projection, what you have now is that the cassette is at the back, and now the heart is away from the cassette. It's a further distance from that cassette. So you, it's automatically there is magnification. The second thing is that you tell the patient to take a maximal inspiration and hold it in. A deep breath in and hold it in. When you do that, this space, the retrocardiac space, increases. But if I ask you to do that, in other words, take a maximal inspiration and hold it 10 times, you won't be able to do it exactly the same each time. That just won't happen. And what that therefore means is that this distance will vary from film to film. And then so your magnification will not be constant. So for that reason, your anterior-posterior projection is not a reliable way to evaluate the heart size. So that's why you need to be able to figure out whether or not this is an anterior-posterior or a posterior-anterior film. You can only reliably evaluate the cardiac size on a posterior-anterior film. So how do we tell the difference? Well, all frontal radiographs are posterior anterior unless labeled otherwise, and that is the international convention. So you will find that anterior posterior films or AP films will either have the word AP erect, or not, in other words, the patient was sitting up or standing up while the st study was done, or supine written on it. All supine films are AP films. So if you don't see any markings on it by convention, it's a posterior anterior or PA film. So, the next thing is the position of the patient. Are they erect or are they supine? Well, again, if they are erect, it will either be labeled, and if it is not labeled, you'll have to assume it is erect because all PA films are erect, and supine films will have labeling on it. But you also can also tell if there are fluid levels. So if the patient is erect, you may see a air fluid level or for example, a dependent fluid in the pleural cavity if the patient has a pleural effusion. The next thing is the centering of the patient. Is the patient centered properly? It is important that the patient Sorry, excuse me. It is important that the patient are centered properly. If the patient is rotated, you'll get a distorted image. So, for example, so the next thing we look at is the centering of the patient. You want the patient to be perpendicular to the 
direction of the beam so that you can have a nice uh, square image. If the patient is rotated, you will get potential image distortion and may be difficult to evaluate the anatomy. In fact, the anatomy might look quite strange to you. So how you evaluate whether or not the patient is rotated or not is that you draw a line connecting the spinous processes so that becomes your reference center point and you look at the distance from that point to the medial ends of the clavicles and they should be equidistant. If one is wider than the other, the patient is rotated. But the patient should also be nice and straight and you should make sure that all the parts that are required are on the film. If you cut off the apices or the bases of the lung, you can't evaluate it. If the, if the structure is not on the film, then you cannot evaluate it. The next thing we do is that we look at inspiratory effort. You want to be able to pull down these lungs, expand these lungs as much as possible. So that's done by a maximal inspiration with the patient doing a breath hold. And this is evaluated by counting ribs. So on the right, this is the posterior aspect of the rib coming around to the anterior aspect of the rib. Same thing right here, okay? So we count either the posterior aspects of the ribs or the anterior aspects of the ribs, both work. Posteriorly, nine to 11 ribs are adequate. Anteriorly, five to eight ribs are adequate. The next thing we look at are what are called exposure factors. Now, just like photography, you basically modify certain parameters to get an image that is best exposed. In photography, we talk about shutter speed and aperture, and pretty much all pictures are, the quality of all pictures are large dependent on that. With x-rays, we similarly have two factors that are important. One is the intensity of the beam, which is given by milliampere seconds or MAS, and the other one is the power of the beam or the energy of the beam, which is given by kilovolts. What you want to have is an adequate number of x-rays, which contribute to the intensity. The more x-rays are in the beam, the more intense it is. But you also want them to have just enough penetrating power, in other words, ability to pass through the patient to expose that film. And it's the differential absorption of the different structures that gives you the image that you have right here. So to evaluate exposure for adequacy, you look at the long markings. You should be able to see the long markings extending from both hyla to about a centimeter from the inner edge of the chest wall. So there is a one centimeter avascular zone at the periphery of, of both lungs. The lungs also do not stop at the edges of the heart or the diaphragm, they wrap around. You need to be able to see lung markings through those as well. If you're unable to see lung markings in these areas, then you can't, you will potentially uh, miss um, pathology or sometimes make it up. So in other words, false positives or negatives. So that is what an adequately exposed film is. So once you've done that, you've now um, evaluated the image for, for quality. You've looked at the demographics of the patient. You've looked at the projection, the position, the centering of the patient, the inspirator effort, as well as the exposure factors. And then we move on to anatomy. And there are different ways to do that. You can either go from centrally out or from outside in or any combination of the above. But it's important that you maintain the same pattern throughout so that you don't miss anything. I tend to go from inside out. So I look here, my mediastinum should be dead centered, right? If the patient is rotated, then this can give you the false impression that the mediastinum is shifted. So that's why you check for rotation first. So the mediastinum should be dead center. You measure your cardiothoracic ratio, as we mentioned before, it should not be more than 50%. And then I look at my mediastinal outline. So starting on the left side, we have the aortic arch with a little bit of the descending aorta, and then it intercepts with this portion of the mediastinum. This little area here represents the central pulmonary arteries. It's called the pulmonary bay, and it should be nice and flat like this. If it's bulged out, it will often mean that the central pulmonary vessels are enlarged, as in pulmonary hypertension, for example, or there may be a mass right there. And then the rest of the left heart border is pretty much the left ventricle. On the right heart border is the right atrium. 
Central, you have your trachea with your right main stem bronchus and your left main stem bronchus. On the right, you should have a thin paratracheal stripe. This is not the tracheal wall. It's a combination of the tracheal wall and adjacent soft tissue structures and should not be more than two millimeters. While there is a paratracheal stripe on the left, you don't often see it because it is obscured or silhouetted by this band here. This little soft tissue band that's extending right here represents the subclavian vessels and this obscures the right paratracheal stripe. After I've done that, I've looked at the mediastinum, I do something that might not be very intuitive. I look at the pleura. But the reason why I do that is because by looking at the mediastinal outline, I've already looked at a pleural interface. So I just continue. So I look here at my cardiophrenic angles, cardiophrenic angles. I look at the surface of the diaphragm. I look at the costophrenic angles. I look along the chest wall, along the chest wall. And I look through both thoraces, both hemithoraces. And that would be evaluation of my pleura. I then come back centrally, follow my long markings out. And uh, as we mentioned before, they should arborize, they branch like a tree, getting smaller and smaller. You should have similar number of lung markings and their distributions in the upper, mid, and lower zones. And then I look at my bones. After that, I look at my thoracic skeleton. You count your ribs, make sure that you're seeing all of those ribs. You look at your clavicles, you look at the shoulder joints if they are there. And then after the bones, I look at my supraclavicular fossae, I look at my axillary and lateral chest wall and subdiaphragmatic. Okay, area. so let's look at some examples of pathology. Here's a list of some of the common things you will see in terms of various types of pathology and we're just going to go through and have a look at some of these. So, here's a little history here, patient with some hoarseness maybe, right? Um, you look here on this chest x-ray this is a normal film for you to compare to. You look and there's an abnormality here. There's widening of that paratracheal stripe. There is some mass effect on that trachea right here. So this is within the mediastinum. Okay, and if you notice, it's actually extending up into the neck. So this represents a, a likely represents a thyroid mass with intrathoracic extension but it could also represent um, lymphadenopathy as well. Here's another example, quite gross abnormalities. So remember, this is a normal one here, abnormal film. Quite gross abnormality here, right? So the mediastinum is quite widened. You can see this big lobulated soft tissue density. It blends with the heart, so you know it's it's within that mediastinum how it blends with the heart and importantly you're able to see um, lung markings lung markings which are these represent the blood vessels and you can see the lung markings quite clearly through this soft tissue um, mass which tells you that this is not in the lung if it were in the lung it would obscure those lung markings so this is a large mediastinal mass okay here's another one and here's a lateral, so more lobula, right? Again, large mediastinal mass. Here is the lateral to show you where it is. So remember now, so this is in the anterior or superior mediastinum. The anterior mediastinum and superior mediastinum are pretty much the same thing. So the differential for a, an anterior or superior mediastinal mass is pretty straightforward and you should know it, right? Um, we mentioned one already, which is a thyroid mass with intrathoracic extension. It's probably one of the most common causes of a superior mediastinal mass. Then there's lymphadenopathy, as is the case here in this patient with Hodgkin lymphoma. So any cause of lymphadenopathy can give you widening of the mediastinum, whether it is malignant or not. Then there are thymic masses, which include thymomas, thymic cysts. And the last one is a mediastinal teratoma. So let's move away from the mediastinum now and have a look at this patient. If you look here, left lung looks nice and normal. Even though it's a supine film, mediastinum looks normal as well. But if you look here, there's this opacity, this soft tissue opacity right here. Okay. 
And importantly, you don't see lung markings in that soft tissue pasty. You don't see air. Now, whenever you see a lesion in the thorax which obscures the lung markings, then you know that this is within the lung. Now, for the purpose of simplicity, there are basically two types of lung disease. There is airspace disease or alveolar disease, and then there is interstitial disease. In both cases, you lose normal lung markings, but in airspace disease, you also lose air, while in interstitial disease, you still have air. I will show you examples of both. So let, taking that into consideration, let's look back at this lesion, which is definitely within the lung. You don't have lung markings in this lesion, so we know it is in the lung, but you also don't have air. So this is airspace disease. Now there are two types of airspace disease. There is collapse or consolidation, and their, their definitions are pretty straightforward. With collapse, what happens is that the air in the airspace is gone, and basically the alveolar walls collapse upon themselves. So what you'll get is an airspace opacity with evidence of volume loss. Simply volume loss, um, you can assess by just looking at the size of the actual hemithorax. It will be smaller than the other side. But often you will also have mediastinal shift toward the side of collapse. The hemidiaphragm on that side, if you can see it, will often be elevated. And the intercostal spaces will be narrower in the area of collapse, something called crowding, compared to the normal side. So in this case, we do not have that. We have preservation of volume. So this is consolidation. And in consolidation, what happens is that the air in the airspace is gone, but it's replaced by something else, often some form of fluid such as pus, uh, transudate, uh, blood, or aspirated fluid, for example, or sometimes tumor. So this is consolidation. Now note, all of those things that can cause consolidation. So it's not um, the word pneumonia and consolidation are not the same. Pneumonia is a cause of consolidation, right? And in that case, you would have exudate or pus. However, if you have pulmonary hemorrhage or if you've aspirated some stuff, then that can also cause consolidation. So this is right of a low consolidation. Here's a normal film to compare it to. Here's another example of consolidation again, but this is just small. This is a small area of consolidation compared to this one. Okay. Again, there's loss of air, loss of your lung markings. There's no volume loss. This is consolidation again within the upper lobe of the right lung. Here's another area of consolidation again. Loss of lung markings, loss of air, no volume loss. But if you notice here, within this area of consolidation, again in the right upper lobe, there's some round air-filled cavities. In this setting, this patient had a pneumonia with some cavitation. That cavitation in this setting would represent abscesses most likely. But if you have hemorrhage as a cause of, of consolidation, that often will cavitate as well, okay? As well as things like infarctions. But these are what abscesses, for example, would look like if you were to have an abscess formation in an area of consolidation. Now this one may be a little bit bizarre. So let's take some time to go through it. Clearly the left side is abnormal. The right side looks pretty normal. What do we have here? Well, if you look, you have this extensive area of soft tissue pacification. If you draw a line through the middle, Above that line, roughly, you don't see any lung markings. Below, you can see some lung markings, even though the lung looks more dense. What we clearly have here is airspace opacification, because there's lots of air, but it does not involve the whole lung. If you notice, this area of airspace opacification obscures the left heart board and the left side of the mediastinum, so it must be adjacent to the left heart border. So the part of the lung that's adjacent to the left heart border is the left upper lobe, and in particular the lingula. So this 
airspace opacification lies within the upper lobe, which is why you can still see some large lung markings in the lower zones because the lower lobe, which is posterior to the upper lobe, is still aerated, so you can still see some air through there. So this is left upper lobe consolidation. There's no volume loss associated with it. These dark streaks that you see here going up into that area of consolidation, these represent air bronchograms. And basically what that means is that the air in the bronchi are still patent, but there's no air in the alveoli surrounding that. So you get this sort of a contrast between the opacified alveoli or air spaces and a patent bron um, bronchus left upper lobe consolidation. Now on this patient, if you notice there's an abnormality here on the right, similar airspace opacification, no air or decreased air, no lung markings. But if you notice it obscures the right heart border, so where would this air of airspace opacification be? Well, if it obscures the right heart border, it's beside it, which means that it must be in the middle lobe. The middle lobe is adjacent to the right heart border. So this is a right middle lobe airspace opacification, which you also see here, but not as well depicted, but the same thing is happening here. When you have middle lobe airspace opacification, it's best to do a lateral film with that because it's difficult to differentiate collapse from consolidation in the middle lobe simply because the middle lobe is, much, is, is pretty small and hence does not cause a lot of volume loss effect. So you won't see anything in terms of mediastinal shift and things like that. But on the lateral, for example, here, in this lateral, in this patient, you notice this is your horizontal fissure, your oblique fissure coming down, and the space in between it is all opacified. This is your opacified middle lobe or your consolidated middle lobe. The volume is preserved. And therefore, this is middle lobe consolidation. In this case, um, the left lung is pretty much normal abnormalities here in the lower zone of the right lung. If you look again, there is no air, lung markings are obscured, so you know that, and there's no volume loss, so you know that there's some consolidation here. You can still see the right heart border, so you know the middle lobe is not involved, but you don't see the diaphragm, which tells you that the lower lobe is involved, so this is consolidation of the lower lobe of the right lung. Consolidation of the lower lobe of the right lung. Okay, got to switch gears a little bit now. If you notice here, clearly abnormality on that right side. There's no air, there's no lung markings at all, so there's something happening within the airspace on that side. So is it collapse or consolidation? It's clearly involving the whole lung because there's no air seen in any part of the lung. What you notice here is that the trachea is deviated to the right. So the trachea is deviated to the side of the abnormality. So that tells you that something has collapsed. This is collapse of the whole of the right lung. There's no air in that lung and there's mediastinal shift towards that side. That tells you that there's collapse of the right lung. Another case. Clearly an abnormality here. The left lung looks fine. When you look right here, if you look closely, this is a normal patient. You have this opacity here in the upper zone or the apex of the right lung. But if you notice the right hemidiaphragm is pulled up, the trachea lifted, shifted slightly to the right. You can see that. This is what the trachea should look like, nice and straight. It's pulled to the right. But if you just look at the entire right hemithorax, it's small. It's noticeably smaller than the left hemithorax. So something has collapsed. And this is right upper lobe collapse. So you have that airspace opacification here in this upper zone with loss of volume, right upper lobe collapse. When the right upper lobe collapses, it collapses in a paramedia and it pulls toward the midline, as we can see in this case, pulls up and toward the midline. How about this? This sort of looks similar to that previous film we showed you on that left. So 
So there is this airspace of pacification, but you can still see some long markings, right? So you know the lower lobe is fine. Upper lobe is abnormal. It's obscu this opacity obscures that left heart border, so you know it's up in that upper lobe. So you have airspace of pacification involved in the upper lobe, but is this collapse or consolidation? A little subtle, but if you look, compare the left, this normal um, image on the left, the trachea is pulled slightly towards that left. And if you notice that aortic arch is pointing toward that left side, it should be nice and straight like that. So there is some mediastinal shift to the left. And this is left upper lobe collapse. This sort of a pacification where you see obscuration of that left heart border, in this sort of hazy pattern, which we also see on this film. You notice here you cannot see the left heart border. The left hemithorax looks hazy. You can still see some lung markings, but clearly the lung volume, sorry, the lung, uh, the, the amount of air in the lung is, is less. This appearance is called the veil or cloak sign and it's a sign of left upper lobe airspace disease. How about this one? Okay, the trach is pulled toward the right side and the right side clearly looks abnormal. The right hemithorax looks much smaller than the left. Look at the left hemidiaphragm is all the way up here. Sorry, the right hemidiaphragm is all the way up here compared to the left hemidiaphragm, all the way up. So something has collapsed. If you look here, you see the sort of a band, the sort of a triangular shaped band here in the lower zone. This represents collapse of the lower lobe of the right lung. And the same thing happens on the left side. Here you can see this, this sort of a triangular shape. You can see the outline drawn here in the lower lobe of the left. So the lower lobes on the right side and the left side collapse in a posterior paramedian location, giving this sort of a triangular shaped uh, kind of um, opacity. Now remember I told you about um, when you evaluate the film for exposure quality that you need to be able to see through the cardiac silhouette to see the lung markings. If you could not do that here, if you could not see lung markings through the cardiac silhouette, you would not pick this up, which is the case here. This patient has a lower lobe, a left lower lobe uh, collapse, but you can't see it here because of how dense the appearance is, you can't quite see the lung markings through the left heart border here, so which is why that is important. So this is lower lobe collapse. One more lobe to go, the middle lobe. Again, here, there's less air right here, lung markings are obscured, there's, a, there's obscuration of the right heart border, so you know there's some airspace disease happening here in the middle lobe on the right. Remember, we need to ask for a lateral in this case, and in this case, you notice you notice that you don't see a normal um, middle um, lobe on the right. What you see is this sort of a thickened band, and what this represents is a collapsed middle lobe. The middle lobe collapses like a clamshell, so both um, horizontal and oblique fissure oppose, and this little band here represents the deflated or collapsed uh, middle lobe on the right. So that was airspace disease. Let's look at interstitial disease. The most obvious types of interstitial, interstitial lung disease have to do with nodules, right? So these are large nodules or masses, and this is the same thing right here, right? And when they're this size, they are called cannonball. When they're about this size, they are coin-shaped uh, or coin lesions, right? So both of these are sort of similar. When you have coin and cannonball lesions, and let's just say that the, the majority of cases where you see these sort of nodules, you're going to be dealing with metastatic lung disease, all right? So I should say that first. So when you have these coin and cannonball um, nodules, you think about renal cell carcinoma. That's probably going to be your diagnosis in terms of cause of metastatic disease that looks like this. But the majority of lung nodules are not big like this. They tend to be tiny, and I'll show you an example in a bit. Here is a left lung mass around the region of the hilum. This is a large bronchogenic carcinoma in this patient. Now, have a look at this chest x-ray. There's air throughout, but if you notice, 
you don't see normal lung markings through here at all. What you see are lots of little dots, lots, innumerable little dots all over the place. So the lung markings are gone, but they're still air. So this is interstitial disease. And what these represent are numerous tiny nodules in a miliary pattern. So these are miliary nodules, right? And if you look at this patient, both hyla are enlarged, or the mediastinum is enlarged. So this likely represents lymphadenopathy with a lot of miliary nodules. This could represent um, miliary tuberculosis, which is what the case was here. But metastatic disease can look just the same. This little um, opaque band here represents a, an, an atelectactic band. You'll hear people talk about atelectactic bands. They often occur toward the lung bases when the lungs are not fully expanded. And this is to compare this chest x-ray to this one to see what the normal lung markings look like compared to here where they're all obscured by all these innumerable nodules all the way through. And this CT scan just gives you an even better idea of how numerous those nodules are, all of these dots in this patient with Miller TB. But remember, these nodules, these, this nodular pattern of interstitial disease, there's a differential for it. It could be infectious, which include TB, some fungal infections like histoplasmosis, um, um, various inf inflammatory lung disease like uh, silicosis and so on can give it this appearance. Some viral diseases can cause this as well. So there's a wide differential for this, and the clinical picture is what's going to be important to help you differentiate. Very bizarre picture. People would just look at this and say, hey, there is a whiteout, or mostly a whiteout of both chests. But again, since you guys are now experts at evaluating lungs, right? Looking at this, we can see in a symmetrical pattern, an airspace opacification. There's lack of air, lack of lung markings, no volume loss. So we're talking about bilateral airspace disease. And this is in a sort of a symmetric kind of bat wing or butterfly configuration. Um, this is the typical finding you get in um, pulmonary edema, right? And causes of this will include congestive cardiac failure, fluid overload, etc. When it gets to this stage, you're usually looking at respiratory at, at, um, a patient who has respiratory distress syndrome. But in the setting of cardiac failure, you don't want to wait until it looks like this. You want to be able to pick it up at this stage. So here we have cardiomegaly, and there is some cephalic redistribution of the, of the pulmonary vascular markings, which is one of the earlier findings. So you sh the lung vessels are supposed to be larger and more prominent in the bases compared to the ap apices. Once they start to look equal or more in the apices, you're talking about cephalization. But if you look along the periphery here, and in this magnified view, you can see it even better, all these little lines. Now remember I told you earlier on that you should have an avascular band right along here, right? A one centimeter avascular band, no lung markings should be here. So when you see lung markings here, then that's abnormal. These rep represent thickened septal lines. And in the setting of congestive cardiac failure, they are called curly B lines. So these represent venous congestion. But other things can do this lymphatic congestion, lymphatic metastases can cause this, as well as other types of, inf of, of um, interstitial disease. Okay. Have a look at this. So we're back toward the mediastinum now. And if you notice, there's a bulge right here. Remember I told you that this here represents the central pulmonary arteries. It should be nice and flat. It's bulge right here. So this could represent enlargement of the pulmonary trunk and central pulmonary arteries. And if you look at the vascular markings here and here and here and here, comparing to here where they're, they gradually branch, there's an abrupt cutoff in diameter and then the lung markings become very imperceptible as you go out. This is called pruning, right? And this is what we see in pulmonary hypertension. Here's a more extreme version, big central pulmonary um, arteries and peripheral oligemia, peripheral pruning of these um, arteries in pulmonary hypertension. 
Here's another patient, huge hilar masses, right? These are lymph nodes. If you notice, up in the apices, you see a lots of lines. There's still air there, but lots of lines obscuring the normal lung markings. These are areas of fibrosis in this patient with sarcoidosis. And this is just a much more severe example of it. Comparing the normal lung, here we see all of these lines that obscure the normal lung markings. There's still air in this patient with sarcoidosis. So moving outside of the lung again now, right? Uh, most of you should know what this one is. You can see an abnormality here toward the right base, but there's a meniscus, a soft tissue pacification, a meniscus, the right hemidiaphragm is obscured. This tells you that this is fluid. So this is a pleural effusion. This is a pleural effusion on the left and a much larger pleural effusion. This one is so big that it's causing mass effect, pushing the medial stand up to the other side. Okay, interesting. Patient got a stab to the chest. What do you notice? There's a marked expansion of this right hemithorax with the medial stand up being pushed all the way to this side. Ignore this appearance. This is because of breast shadows, right? So it looks like that. This left lung, let's just say, is normal. So there's hyperexpansion of that right lung mediastinum is pushed all the way over into the left side. And if you notice inside of this, it's filled with air, but you see no lung markings. So this is not lung. As a matter of fact, this little slight hazy opacity here, right here is a collapsed right lung. What this represents is a massive pneumothorax, a massive pneumothorax with mediastinum shift to the other side. This represents a tension pneumothorax. Okay, and you remember, you should know that in the setting of attention pneumothorax, that should be a clinical diagnosis. A chest radiograph really does not play any role at the diagnostic stage. You need to intervene in these patients using uh, decompression thoracostomy with a needle. This is another large pneumothorax. Have a look at this film. If you notice here, look outside of the chest lots of air in the soft tissues in the supraclavicular fossa in the axillae here okay so this is what we describe as subcutaneous emphysema right and if you look here in the mediastinum there's a lot of air you should not see any air in that mediastinum here outside of the trachea and lots of it is outlining the mediastinum here you can actually see air outlining the aorta as well okay and if you look well, you can see this little thin line. This is a pericardium. So there's air deep to that. So there's a pneumopericardium as well. So this is an extensive pneumomediastinum. All right. This patient did not have any injury. So if the patient uh, actually presented with some chest pain after severe bouts of vomiting and retching, and the chest x-ray showed off, it said clinically the patient had a lot of crepitus in, up here in the supraclavicular fossa, etc. This actually was a case of Borhave syndrome as a result of retching. Incidentally, those of you who are really looking around, you may notice this sort of a triangular opacity here. It obscures the right hemidiaphragm, it's in the lower lobe. The right lung has a, is decreasing volume compared to the left. Again, right lower lobe collapsed. Right, this patient just incidentally also has right lower lobe collapse, right? But the, what we wanted to show you here is really the pneumomediastinum. A quick word about ventilation perfusion scanning. This is nuclear medicine. We will have a separate talk on this, which we'll go into more detail. But ventilation perfusion scans or VQ scans are used primarily for pulmonary embolism. They're not used as much anymore because of the use and the great advantage of using CT pulmonary angiography for the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. But this uses the whole concept of a ventilation perfusion mismatch. So basically, if you have a PE, the area of the lung that's affected by the thrombus in the pulmonary artery, the ventilation will be fine. So there's normal ventilation there, but the perfusion will be decreased or absent, giving a ventilation perfusion mismatch. So how it works is that you give radioactive substances um, for the ventilation part of the scan, 
you breathe in the radioactive substance, which then basically equalizes in, in the air spaces. You image that, and you also give, you inject intravenously radioactive substance. They're basically technetium-99 based um, radioactive substances um, for the for the uh, for the um, perfusion scan and a xenon uh, based agent for the ventilation scan, and you look for a mismatch. So here's what the mismatch looks like. Well, sorry, this is what a normal perfusion scan. So if you notice, this white stuff represents radioactive uptake detected by the special nuclear medicine camera. It's called a gamma camera. And this black space here represents the heart. There's no uptake there. So nice, smooth uptake in the left lung and the right lung. And these are various projections. On the ventilation scan, here, this is a patient, by the way, with PE, but this is what the ventilation scan looks like. If you compare this to this, you see how smooth the perfusion scan looks. The ventilation scan tends to be very mottled because of this is these just represent uh, filling or uptake in the air sacs. And you also will see uptake in the trachea because you've breathed in the stuff, right? So this patient has a normal ventilation scan. So let's just look at the anterior projection. You can ignore these for now. This is the ventilation scan, that's a perfusion scan. And if you look at the right side, normal ventilation, but on the perfusion scan, that upper lobe, you don't see any uptake at all compared to the normal ventilation here. Also, you see a wedge-shaped area of lack of uptake here in the lower zone on this side as well. So these are segmental defects, right, with a ventilation-perfusion mismatch in this patient who has a PE. Now, lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about computed tomography, right? Uh, this is a big tool in the evaluation of the chest, various types of chest pathology. There are different types of CT. There's a routine CT scan, which uh, most people request, but there's also the CT angiogram, and then there's high-resolution CT scanning. A quick note on high-resolution CT scan, this is typically a non-contrast study with very thin slices to give you very sharp detail. And it's used primarily to look at things like interstitial lung disease and emphysema. The CT angiogram is used primarily to look at blood vessels, right? So you, there is a CT aortic angiogram, the pulmonary angiogram, and the coronary angiogram, and others as well. The main differences between the two, between these, sorry, is timing. With a pulmonary angiogram, what you want to do is to catch the contrast that you give the patient, the contrast agent in the right side of the circulation. You want to have it maximally concentrated there. So you tend to scan early. And you scan a little bit later for your aortic angiogram and your coronary angiogram. The routine CT scan is not, timing doesn't play a big, necessarily a big role there. As you probably know, CT is digital, uses large data sets from which you can do various post-processing so that you can actually get more information. It utilizes uh, contrast media very often, and there is relatively high doses of radiation, so you need to keep those things in mind when you're ordering this for your patients. But more importantly for you, you should know what the indications for CT are. Okay, so a good way to do this is by categorizing them into urgent or emergency indications and non-urgent or elective indications. In the emergency setting, there is trauma and non-traumatic indications. And in trauma, you're pretty much looking at suspected mediastinal or great vessel injury. That's the main reason, not for injury to the lung. A chest x-ray is adequate to diagnose a pneumothorax, which is their main finding in injury to the lung. So in the setting of penetrating injuries, you're talking about missiles or projectiles um, that cross mediastinum. If you clinically have a suspected great vessel injury, for example, if you have um, uh, asymmetry between the pulses or for any other reason why you may suspect mediastinal injury. And the same thing is with blunt injuries. In the non-traumatic scenario, most of these are vascular emergencies, such as dissections, ruptured aortic aneurysms, or suspected pulmonary embolism. 
But here is one scenario which, um, which is non-vascular, which may come up sometimes, is when you're trying to differentiate between a lung abscess and a pleural lymphoma. If for some reason it's not clear on a chest x-ray, it's important to do a CT for the reason that lung abscesses are treated with antibiotics generally, while empyemas are surgically drained. So if you, you, if you can't differentiate them on a, on a chest x-ray, you, you need to, to do a CT so you can um, make that diagnosis. Okay, let's show you a few examples now. So this is a CT pulmonary angiogram. So ignore the green arrows for, for now, just to point out some things to you. This is your superior, so just to orient you, this is anterior, this is posterior, this is the right, this is the left. This is an axial image, this is a corona reconstructed image. So this image was derived from the axials. We basically stack the axial images digitally and re-slice them in the coronal plane, okay, to get these images. So, if you notice here, this is your superior vena cava, this is your pulmonary trunk, right and left pulmonary arteries, and this is your ascending aorta and your descending aorta. And if you notice that as you move from superior vena cava to pulmonary arterial tree to aorta, you're getting decreased densities. And this has to do with timing. You've scanned early to catch the contrast in the right side of the circulation so you can get good outlining of the pulmonary arteries. You're not as concerned about the aorta. And if you look inside the pulmonary trunk and, and the, pul the bifurcation in particular into the right and left pulmonary arteries, there are these filling defects. And there are even more filling defects at the bifurcation of the left pulmonary artery and the bifurcation of the right pulmonary artery. On the right here, you can see this better on the coronal reform re reconstruction with this filling defect crossing over the bifurcation. These filling defects represent thrombi. And this is, so this is a patient with pulmonary thromboembolism. This is a massive type of pulmonary embolism with a saddle embolus. So this is what a saddle embolus would look like. There's another CT here. And if you notice here, there's more contrast. If you compare this one to this one, if you looked at the contrast in the aorta here on the pulmonary angiogram compared to this one, the contrast is much more dense here because we've scanned a little later. So this, this is a CT aortic angiogram. And if you look here, this is the ascending aorta, descending aorta. This is the left pulmonary artery, right main stem bronchus, left stem, main stem bronchus here, roughly at the level of the carina here. But if you look here in the ascending aorta, you see this. This is an intimal flap. All right, this is an intimal flap in a patient with an aortic dissection. And it's affecting the ascending aorta, not the descending aorta. So you know when the flap starts in the ascending aorta, when the dissection starts in the um, ascending aorta, you're dealing with a Stanford A type aortic dissection. If it starts distal to the origin of the left subclavian artery, that's a Stanford B. Stanford A aortic dissection, dissections need to be treated surgically for several reasons. One, if the dissection goes down to the aortic root, it can dissect the, the aortic valves off of the, the valve itself. The valve cuffs, cuffs off the valve ring, and then you have intractable aortic regurgitation, which is not compatible with life. The dissection can go all the way through and cause a rupture or leaking, right? Which has happened in this patient. You actually, this sort of heterogeneous appearance to the mediastinum represents clot. So this patient has a ruptured dissection. But if this rupture extends down to the aortic root, then it, the bleeding can, occ can occur into the pericardial cavity, giving you a, a severe cardiac tamponade, which again is not compatible with life. And one last reason is that the flap can go into the coronary arteries themselves at the level of the aortic uh, root at the, at the sinuses of Valsalva, and that can cause thrombosis of the coronary arteries and hence give you a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. So this is an aortic dissection. It's a Stanford A aortic dissection. But outside of the emergencies, uh, there are a whole host of indications, and this list is no, by no means um, um, expansive. A very common indications are someone who gets a chest X-ray for whatever reason, even for a routine medical, for, an ins for insurance purposes, for example, 
and you see a solitary nodule or some other suspicious lesion, a CT scan is often ordered to, um, to evaluate that. The same thing in the mediastinum and in the pleura. In patients with lung cancers, as well as other cancers, right, um, should not just be other thoracic, but other cancers, CTs of the chest are often used as a part of the staging protocol. And then there are a whole host of other indications as outlined there. Now, the last thing I'm just going to touch on is PET CT. This is nuclear medicine again. PET means positron emission tomography. And this is a gold standard for staging, for distant staging for most cancers. It's used to stage nodal and distant metastases. So remember, staging of tumors for most tumors goes along the TNM system, tumor node metastasis system. Local or tumor staging is best done with CTA and or MRI, but distant um, metastases, including nodal or distant metastases, these are best done with PET CT. And this is what it looks like. This is the PET scan. These are this is uptake of the of the radioactive agent in lots of these enlarged lymph nodes in the mediastinum. Here is splenic uh, uptake as well, and in the skull base. So this patient has lymphoma, and with a PET CT, what happens is that you fuse the PET image with the CT image to get a fusion image like this, okay? And there's even PET MRI now. So this is PET CT. And that's about it. Thank you for listening.